Thank you, Kay. Um, hello, I'm Taro. I'm a math major here at Brown. So um, yeah, I guess before introducing the speakers, I'll just talk about what the panel's about. So the question is, what is space? Um, uh, that's a really vague question. Um, I think it's important to ask what the question means, I guess, first. Um, yeah. And so uh, can space have different definitions is, I guess, one of the ways to uh, talk about this. And um, how can we explore each of these different spaces? Um, and so, yeah, uh, while you guys are thinking about that, um, I'll just introduce each person. Um, so the first person uh, on the panel, Professor Jim Gates, a Ford Foundation professor of physics at Brown University. And um, through his equations, uh, he tries to describe the story of our universe in a mathematical way. And in his most recent work, uh, his equations have uh, led him to various visual representations. Um, the next person, um, Stephen Metcalf, a sculptor who mainly works in geometric forms, for his piece is right here. Um, his, uh, many of his sculptures revolve around this idea called tensegrity, using continuous tension to uh, put individual sculptural elements in like a floating configuration. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Professor Kinaleski, uh, the principal of the architecture firm 360 Architecture, and uh, the primarily, primary author of the RISD first year design curriculum for the architecture students for 29 years. And her interests lie in the creative process uh, and the relationship between uh, space and discovery. So uh, we're going to have each panelist. Oh, please welcome them. <laughs> And so um, we'll have each panel for that person talk for 10 minutes. And um, after that, we'll have a Q&A session. So uh, I guess please sit. Um, the first person to talk is uh, Professor Jim Gates. Thank you. I was wondering about that. So good morning, everyone. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now I know you're awake at least. It is early. Uh, I just flew in from Chicago, uh, gave a, com a convocation address at Chicago State University. And uh, when I was invited to be part of this, I was like, what in the world are these people after with me? You know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a math guy. I like to tell people that uh, maybe you know that show with the Big Bang Theory. Some of you might know that television program. Uh, well, I'm not Sheldon Cooper, but I do what he pretends to do in that TV show, and I've been, I've been doing that all my adult life. So I want to take you through a little part of that, because part of that is answering the question about what is space. So what I wanted to do, first of all, was talk about, I'm going to talk about my own research, but I'd like to start with um, this quote from Einstein. After a certain high level of technical skill is achieved, art and science coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity, and form. Now, when I first read this statement many years ago, I had no idea what Albert Einstein was talking about. But that's not unusual. He said many things that when I was young I had no idea about, so that's perfectly consistent. But I'm 67 years old. I have over now 30 years of experience as a theoretical or mathematical physicist. And many of the things that were mysterious to me when I was young actually make sense now. So that's part of why I'm here to share with you today. Oh, that expression, l'arte della physica, uh, the art of physics. Uh, in my early uh, part of my career, I actually used to spend my summers in uh, Italy. There's a, a theoretical physics research center there near Venice called the International Center for, for Theoretical Physics. And as a consequence, Pilati Italiano un poco. I used to actually speak Italian. I don't anymore, but uh, I still remember a few words. So what I'm going to do here is start with a really weird discovery, namely the thing that you see on the far left is a square. Everyone recognizes a square, right? Same side, length on each side. So I'm going to start dressing this square up. Put black and white dots at alternating points around the edges. Color parallel lines the same. So the two up and down lines get green, the cross line, one and cross face get red. And then I'm going to put a rule that says no open dot and closed dot can be at the same height. If you take the object in the middle, there are two ways to get out of that. You get the two image images on the side. Now, the rules that I just gave you are so simple that you could teach them to a first grader. 
But it turns out, buried in those rules is a set of mathematical equations. And this is something I discovered together with a colleague of mine about 12 years ago. That this, if you follow that set of rules for building images, they correspond to equations. And not just any old equations, but the equations that tend to describe our reality. So in this simple example, because I just wanted you to get the concept of what's going on, these equations are too simple to describe our reality. But there are other more complicated equations that describe electrons, that describe particles of light, that describe gravity, that describe what we call the weak interaction force carriers, quarks, all of those things that you may have heard about in science. We know how to get the equations of things by playing this game. Now this was stunning to us. Uh, my colleague uh, Michael Fox and I in 2006 and the word adinkra, well, where'd that come from? Well, when we first discovered this weird correspondence between equations and pictures, we thought it would be very important to pursue this. And so in mathematics, when you find a new idea, you get to name it. It's just like having a child. You get to name your own child. So we decided to name these images. And Michael, um, who was in the Czech Republic when we were doing this work, uh, had stepped on the African continent 10 years before I had ever visited the continent. And so he knew a lot more about uh, African culture than I did, which you may think is odd because after all, he's a European American, I'm an African American, don't I know my own culture, right? But he did. And so he said, you know, I, I have a name for these things. Let's call them adinkras. This word, A-D-I-N-K-R-A. -A. The traditional meaning of adinkra is a symbol with hidden meaning, and it comes from West Africa, which is very appropriate for our discovery. So we just, in, in typical colonial fashion, we appropriated the word. Here's another example. So now it starts, you can play this game over and over again with bigger and bigger squares. The thing that I'm showing you on the upper left-hand corner is what's called a tesseract. That's a square if the world had four spatial dimensions. Our world only has three. But we mathematicians and physicists know how to draw the mathematics of higher dimensional worlds. And therefore, for us, we view space through the lens of mathematics. And that's the perspective I bring to this. Now that particular object I'm starting with, I'm going to turn it into the, one of these adinkras by the sequence of operations that you can see. Here's that final object, illustrated in a slightly different manner, but the movie does not seem to be running. Thank you, sir. It turns out that just like before, I told you there are equations. Well, now we have this strange, we're in a strange position that I know how to do mathematics by playing with manipulating images. And that's what we're doing here. When I move things horizontally, I'm doing what's in math language is called matrix multiplication. When I start moving things up and down, we're going to even see a more interesting. That's actually calculus. This is visually how you do calculus within a set of objects. So I'm doing integrals. I don't know how many of you remember your calculus classes and how horrible that experience might have been, but I can do this now as a child's game. And now we're doing three integrals. You see, there's these two identical subcells now. They weren't obviously there where we began, but they're there. So the question is, are they two subcells or is one the reflection of the other? The way that you test that is to see if you can smash them together with perfect matching white ball to white ball, dash blue lines to dash blue, solid red to solid red, dash red to dash red, solid green to, and can you get a perfect matching? Well, I've just gone through a set of manipulations here, and now you can see I can perfectly match them together. And so one of those subcells might have been the mirror image of the other. Now, the really interesting thing about that, I'm going to open it up. The thing that I started with actually describes the mathematics for particles of light. This final image that I'm telling you about, or showing you, describes the mathematics for electrons. And so we have a visual way of accomplishing something that Einstein wanted all his life, something he called the unified field theory a set of equations that not would just describe light and electrons, but describe everything that scientists see. So we have a mathematical framework that we discovered with Michael that seems to go a fair piece towards that. Oops. So here's some simple examples. We're running through it again and again, adding more balls, more colors. And now you're looking at massive sets of equations rendered as images through this, this sort of visual technology that we've developed. So I have a colleague who actually developed a piece of software that literally takes sets of equations, and we have this algorithm. It's much like a compression algorithm. And the output 
our equations. Now, when we were designing this, it wasn't because we, want, we were looking to the day when I had to come to RISD, one of the premier art centers in the world, and give you an artistic display. But that's what just happened. And it shows you something very interesting about the way that people like me view the world. For us, mathematics is a palette. It's also a language. In fact, it's the most unusual human language I know. It lets you more precisely than any other language that we have know what another person is thinking. Simple example, if oh, I say the color red... Excuse me, can you uh, go closer to the mic, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, if fine. I say the color red, what exact red am I talking about? Is it fire engine red? Or is it the red of the setting sun? What red am I talking about? So when you use words and pictures, and that's typically how we humans communicate, there's always this massive imprecision in what you're trying to communicate to another person. And that's imprecision. Uh, a scientist uh, by the name of Eddington said, the trouble with using language to describe nature is there are not enough tenses. And that catches the imprecision that language has built into it. On the other hand, people like me, we use mathematics. That gives us a kind of precision. It also has a five to 600 year long history of, of providing us the most accurate description of nature. In fact, it's the only language that we know that has this property. It also has one other property I find rather astounding. If you, mathematics is the only human language I know about where it is impossible to tell a lie because the structure of the language makes that detectable by the person on the other side. That's again a property that I see in no other human language. So when you ask the question, what space to someone like me, what we immediately start to think about is what are the way in which the properties of this thing we call space, how, did that, how do we see them in mathematics? Well, first thing I would tell you is that space is a thing. It's not something that is nebulous. It's a thing that we, uh, we can manipulate. Another important thing is we see different kind of spaces in mathematics. The kind of space that we move through, we call that configuration space. The kind of pictures I showed you are partly related to those spaces, but because of certain aspects of string theory, they are also related to spaces that have to do with what we call electrical charge, what we call color, the properties of things that we see in nature are thought in our language of mathematics to correspond to spaces. And so if you ask me what space, I'm going to give you the answer scientists will give you of, of my training. It's an attribute that mathematics precisely describes and describes most precisely for humans. Thank you. Stephen Metcalf talk now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to sort of, I also think that uh, space is a construct um, and primarily because we are basically using it as a way to understand a universe around us. But we, in fact, had nothing to do with the making of that universe. Um, my interest is uh, in this talk is really to start with uh, experiences that led to this particular sculpture. And they started basically across the street, uh, just south of the Market Street building, where uh, some RISD students about 60 years ago and their professor put together a sandbox with a prism, a water prism, and uh, mirrors, and uh, then they built these sort of glass spheres with, with rods, and the idea was that you could take the, the uh, mirror and shine the sun through the prism, and then another mirror, and take that sunlight, that broken up spectrum of sunlight, and uh, make these glass spheres sort of change color and sparkle. And uh, when you're a nine-year-old, that's very exciting. And uh, now I'm going to fast forward to uh, probably my first day in foundation. Um, and our first homework assignment was foam, and there was no explanation. The following day, there were 50 responses, and the crit process was underway. We 
were in Kansas. We weren't in Kansas anymore. And uh, I finally sort of took this opportunity uh, to make a glass water prism and uh, kind of spread the rainbow across a 50-foot room and then shine, uh, use a second mirror to sort of look at each color. And uh, anyway, that uh, satisfied that particular sort of yearning to sort of really try redo that experiment. Because I could build uh, uh, glass boxes, um, um, I, there was an assignment, it's kind of a typical assignment in uh, foundation class, where you draw an object on the outside of a box, and from that you learn uh, basically plan, elevation, and section. Uh, I, in turn, um, actually took the glass box that I built and began to move around uh, drawing, the, the, in this case, a Coca-Cola bottle. And very quickly, the shapes that I was drawing began to sort of become blobs instead of that iconic uh, Coca-Cola bottle. And that led me basically to ask, how would I remain stationary and this object move around me? In other words, I'd begun to realize that in drawing this, I, was, I, I had to keep changing my point of view. Um, the answer to that question was a geodesic sphere, um, would, and I fitted the geodesic uh, sphere with sails made of aluminum foil. I went across the street. There was a great lawn that went to a pair of steps that are the on the no longer on the museum of, in Kansas City, the uh, Nelson Atkins. But much to my surprise, this object sort of flew up the lawn and up the stairs and. I was sort of hooked. Um, so um, I simplified it, and uh, and uh, it became an icosahedron, and the sails became sort of a wonderful trihelix. And um, I kept building this over and over again until I got it up to about 12 feet in diameter. Took it out to the prairie. And uh, it, the real thing is that it began to do things that I had no control of and, uh, and sort of tell me about sort of what it would, wanted to do. So this would become over and over again uh, a part of building sculptures was you start at this smaller scale and you build it up it doesn't do exactly what you expect, but it may do something far more interesting than what you expected. And you sort of take those enhancements or, or those functionalities and incorporate them into something else. And the next example, uh, well, I should give credit to uh, uh, Tom Banchoff, who, uh, <laughs> I had took a, a summer course with at Brown, and he introduced me to duels. So now this is sort of where the geometries really begin to come into their own. Um, duels, very simply, are where um, if you have an octahedron, you've got uh, eight sides, and those eight sides will correlate to the eight corners on a cube. So they are duels of one another, the cube and the octahedron. And they make building things uh, very much easier because you, you, you sort of, un, you, you're beginning to reduce things down to lines, points, and faces and, um, and understanding different relationships by sort of switching them around. So, points could become faces, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the next structure I built um, was 
a garage based on what's called a anti-prism. It was a square base and you rotate the upper square base and then link them with uh, triangles. Well, at one point that structure was the four triangles uh, uh, connected at the base but it only held up with a wire at the tips and it oscillated and uh, I became totally fascinated with that oscillation and this is, a, this is sort of the end product, what you see in front of you. Um, Should I oscillate it? Sure, you? oscillate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to oscillate the wings because that's uh, basically the, uh, and the wings can also be folded in, so it sort of has all sorts of surprising uh, properties in a funny way. But um, uh, the first one of those I built, you always, we were always, so I made little models, and then in sculpture class, you're always sort of encouraged to build bigger. So I went big. I, the arms, the parts that are moving, were beams that were 20 foot long, and they were on uh, concrete piers. And I was all very excited to get this thing. I, designed the uh, uh, bearings to be frictionless as much as possible. And so finally this structure is standing proud in the park and, and, uh, and along comes the light little breeze and the arms go down and they stay down. And it was like a total disappointment. I wanted them to oscillate. <laughs> And uh, it took another 20 years to sort of get a structure that would oscillate, that would move in the wind, that, um, that was sort of what my mind was interested in as a f final product. Uh, but the fun part, and I guess, is that um, the, sh the, the the uh, oscillation, the shape of these uh, four sides of the square that are um, changing position. I had a, a friend who was a physicist and basically sort of compared that to a gravity wave. And I think, I, I think the fun part of it was and I could understand, sort of, because I could apply Pythagorean's theorem to this. Oh, sorry, you have one more minute. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, very simply put, that lifted the scope, that lifted sort of my, that's where my fascination for so much science uh, comes from, the current sort of exploration of space. Um, and I find that there are all these, like when they talk about symmetry, it sort of gives you a whole sense of space that's, uh, that you wouldn't have sort of building uh, small objects, <laughs> and small even when they're 60 feet across. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, part of the Eighth Elegy, never, not for a single day, do we have before us that pure space that the flowers continually open into. For us, it's always a world and never a nowhere without the no, a pure, unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize and not be longing after. So do we, have, do we ever have that space that's unoccupied? Or if we can occupy it with our mind, does it not exist? It, it is it no longer free? Because the architects always have to inhabit space, not only physically, but we have to inhabit it mentally. We make drawings, we make models that anticipate the building that we have to mentally inhabit. And so how inhabit for me is always not just a physical thing, but it's also how we occupy space through looking at drawings at other representations as well, or articulations of thought. And also, so there it is, a pure unguarded space you can breathe and fully realize and not be longing after. And I think what I'm, gonna, what I'm focusing on is, is that threshold between when it's pure and it's space, and then when we know it and it becomes familiar and you occupy it. And that threshold to me is what discovery is, and that's what I'm going to show. Great Gatsby has a great ending to uh, it where F. Scott Fitzgerald talks about a settler to this continent standing on the north shore of Long Island and looking at uh, Connecticut. And, for a tra and then it says, for a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history, with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. Now, I don't think it was the last time in history, but that idea of being face to face with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder, placing yourself right before the discovery, that sense of aha, that sense of breath, of space opening up, that to me is space, that threshold of discovery before you occupy it, before you inhabit it, but a sense of it being there. And it, with that in mind, let's look at some discoveries. This is a theory by a professor at Oxford about the discovery of zero as a, as a numeral. That, that he, his, his theory is that when counting with just stones in the ground and lifting one up, the, the concept of a void existed in India, but it wasn't a numeral. And he thinks it happened like that, that the absence of the stone being there had a physical presence and became a thing, an entity, zero, which completely changed mathematics. And I'm not the only one who thinks about this. I, I, for others, like a, a number of poets or for uh, John Berger, what I'm talking about is a field. It's the field that you place in front of you when you're working. It's everything that you start to, you, you're dwelling within, that certain things then become recognizable that weren't before. And that's very important, how you work, the field that you create in front of you, or where you, what you start to recognize. Like famously with uh, Richard Feynman when he was recounting the origins of his electron spin theory, he talked about uh, seeing a waiter or a, 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 an employee in the Cornell cafeteria throwing up a plate, and he noticed a, a difference. Well, he says right here, I had nothing to do, so I started figuring out the motion of the rotating plate. I discovered that when the angle is very slight, the medallion, or the Cornell logo, rotates twice as fast as the wobble rate. I went, out, went on to work out equations for wobbles. Then I thought about how electron orbits start to move in relativity. Then there's the Dirac equation in electrodynamics. And then there's quantum electrodynamics. And before I knew it, the whole business that I got the Nobel Prize came from that piddling around with the wobbling plate. So the fact that he was there to recognize it is important. It couldn't have been anyone else, but he, he did make a connection between his work that prepared him for recognizing an event that was right in front of him. Now, how we gather up the field is dif very dif different, and this is my point, depending on who we are. How a field is gathered up by one, you know, a farmer and his equipment versus a, a bird. How we gather up the field in front of us is very subjective, and I think that's true for everyone, including scientists. Artists know this, we, we recognize the importance of how we each, each of us see, and that you, is, uh, is, is behind the whole idea of the blind contour that most anyone who went to RISD has done at least once, where you're drawing without looking at the page. And it becomes this record of how you are seeing, because you're not focusing on what the drawing looks like, you're just recording your own, your own observation of what you're in front of, that feels you're in front in front of, 
And the, the, so just looking at the glance, just looking at how we look, how particular and subjective that is, how important and loaded the glance is, like you can see in this painting, the, the, all the glances and how much they're taking in and also communi communicating, participating in the field, throwing out, which was something that the scientist, uh, this, what I'm showing you here is Alfred Yarbus studied saccades, the motions of the eyes in making observations, and he traced them using these devices that his, uh, these sub subjects wore. And he found that there was, and I don't have time to go into it, this, but that everyone's way of observing is, has a particular signature. And so you can start to recognize the way different people see by their signature way of observing, and also how it's affected by what questions you ask them. The impact of, that another person will have on what you end up recognizing because of what they ask you to see. So an ex another example of this, of how one's personal life, this, one's own subjectivity, impacts discoveries. One of my heroes, Katie Payne, uh, who's the founder of the Elephant Lis Listening Pop Project at Cornell and the Institute there, one day was at the zoo and she felt something when she was near the elephants. Now she had spent her life dedicated to listening to and studying whale songs. So she was prepared to make this discovery, but she felt something. So she recorded what sounded like silence and then brought it back to the laboratory and sped it up, sped up the recording, and this is what she heard. Now these sounds are not audible to the human ear at the normal speed because the frequency is too low. It's outside of the spectrum of human hearing. The reason why she could hear this is because she was a Quaker and growing up as a little girl, she was in church and very often felt the vibration in the air, what she called the shuddering of the air at the lower registers of the organ. So she was prepared to make this discovery. It needed someone like Katie to, 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 to think to slow, uh, to speed up the tape. And what she found is that, um, what she found is that the elephants have a highly developed language. It's not just semantics, it's syntax. And you can go online and you can observe all, all sorts of rituals that they've been able to decipher, like a funeral for adolescent elephant, et cetera. So this, um, another poet who writes about this, uh, just a brief quote, should nature, all right, well, should nature at times on our awaking propose to us the very thing to which we were disposed? This is something we all desire, what we were disposed to, to, to discover. Like this uh, scientist at Worcester Polytechnic who, who was studying heart tissue and developing heart tissue, ate a spinach salad one day, and this is only about a year ago, recognized the, the vascular system. So he washed it in shower gel, removing the chlorophyll, and now is pumping blood through it, and it's being used as um, heart tissue. All right, so I'm going to speed ahead to pedagogy because um, I'm, I have to stick to the time, apparently. This is a project from 10 years ago. Students looked through uh, slides for inspiration and built what they saw. With, and th this is something that I, I don't... Uh, I like the students to begin immediately, and I also believe in working with material because I think, as Stephen pointed out, there's all unexpected things that happen and that you're not, you're not deciding what you want to discover before you actually start engaging with the material. It messes with you, it gets in the way. Material is like the artists say, is a medium. It goes in between you and your intentions. And it reveals something that is not necessarily the stated intention. So these are, this is, for instance, a feather that a student saw under the microscope. And we focus on joints because it's all about the articulation of the order of space and of the order of the field of the problem that is important. And so the behavior of the joints and the vectors make these structures that have behaviors, like the squishiness of this material that was constructed from music wire and vinyl tubing, or this more folded origami type behavior of this other one which then leads to ideas about structure that can be translated to a larger scale in building. And finally, this is a current project that a student of mine is doing, and I won't have time to make the beautiful closed loop back to my original point, but uh, she is uh, working, we are working on The Tempest by, by Shakespeare. We're making storms for production at University of California. 
And this one student, Nat, is studying uh, Prospero, the lead character in, in Tempest, and his uh, mapping of the unfamiliar utopia, utopia actually, the etymology of utopia, uh, is nowhere. So we go back to that, that threshold of the space that you don't occupy. And she's mapping it through this four bar linkage, which is what this, you see this image of, which has a variable length. This is what we do as architects. We build the order of the world, the field of the problem, as a, as a space that has very physical geometric attributes and phenomenal ones as well. Thank you. Hello again. Oh, wait, is this on? OK, it is. Um, uh, please thank our uh, panelists again. And uh, so we'll be starting the Q&A session. I, I would say most deliberately no. I mean, I in fact called that um, Making of Design Principles course a, a foundational studies. So that, and I anticipated, I, I sort of wanted the students to feel that they would reach for the ground for this foundation, foundation that they expected in a first design studio and find that it's not there. There's a philosopher, Ortego y Gasset, who talks about the condition of being shipwrecked as the beginning of culture. That's not thick. And, and, we, and you know, where the lymph nodes are not thick with material, but where you're, you're the, the whole act of swimming and survival is a, an authentic creation of, of culture. It's not relying on what others have found before. And so for me, it's, it's really important that it's, you, it's a foundational. I'll just say, a lot of my sculptures have round bases. They're not fixed to the ground. And like the rolling icosahedron, it just can go across the landscape, um, you know, without a. So, so I can picture that in a, a large number of different environments. I can put it on the ocean. I can, you know, they they sometimes tease me because there's a there's some group that builds these things that can walk in outer space that are. You know, the legs change length. And they're basically, I always go, no, the icosahedron, that's the better one. <laughs> so. Good question. Uh, next. Uh, oh. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, I'm fascinated by the physics, the visualization of the string theory. And with architecture and sculpture, for me, it seems like, you know, you have an idea, then you go to the, you go to the medium, and then you change. I'm wondering, you change your idea, and you, it's kind of a trial and error thing, and, but with the visualization for the, um, for the string theory, how does that, how does the visualization affect you at the beginning, you know, when you're developing your equations. So, as, as I was just said about shipwrecks, at the beginning we actually don't have those things. It's, it's a very, that's why I described it as a dialogue. In fact, I should have said, in my case, it's a three-sided dialogue. It's me and the peculiar um, way that my subconscious works. It's the universe because there are rules out there that people like me are trying to understand. And then there's mathematics, because mathematics is actually the medium for how we actually create our dyes. So we essentially carve in mathematics. The fact that it comes back to, to visualization is, I think, a very interesting and key point. So many times if you talk to mathematicians, they'll tell you an equation is beautiful, or there are beautiful things about this proof. And for most people, that, that is a totally opaque statement because all they know about mathematics is what they saw in school where you write a bunch of symbols on a paper. It's dead, it's not alive, it's not interactive. But for people like me who actually meet, make new mathematics, it's an alive character. It's a medium that contracts, it, can, it expands, but we are the, uh, in some sense, we are the uh, catalyst that that medium works through to bring the discussion back to our species. So we didn't start off with this idea that the visualization was there. 
we kept pushing on the equations and we felt this emotional response to the equation where, I mean, for people like me, these things really are beautiful. And then we struggle with ways to express that and more efficiently communicate that to other colleagues. And then it pops into the visual realm. That's what happened in my story. Can I ask a follow-up question? Because I, I, uh, when I was looking at the visualizations, before you showed the movie, I could, I could see that there was a rotation. You know, like I, right. I started to get you know, what was happening in space. But it immediately made me wonder whether the, the equations themselves or if the distances between these points do change or not. That's a great question. It's actually a technical question. And mm -hmm. um, our colleague here kind of hinted at the answer because he talked about Tom Bantoff, mm -hmm. whose work, by the way, is embedded in my work also in a curious way. I, I, we didn't <laughs> and, set that and, up. But and I was, mine as well. There's a project I could show that yeah, I worked yeah. with him on. Right, yeah. so I was really surprised. Uh, but the answer to your question is no, because mm -hmm. what we're doing is what's called topological spaces, mm -hmm. and the topological space is different. The distances don't matter, but the connectivity does. Mm -hmm. So that would be, that was my response to like your question when I was looking at your work, if, because, is, I would, I would understand that in my world as a problem, you know, to find a way to articulate in the visual medium, you know, yeah. so that, anyway. So I, let me, the other thing is, um, I have to, one thing that is going to be perhaps of interest in response, it's people like you actually that drove me to the visualization. And so I'm, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm someone, who, if you leave me alone, I'll do theoretical physics. That's what I tell people. Put me in a corner, I'm going to do some physics. It's mathematical physics. But I also have an attribute of my career where I'm often in conversation with non-scientists. I speak broadly to, um, at popular level conferences and yeah, I, I've done almost over a dozen uh, Nova Science documentaries. And in that interaction with the public, what I found at one stage in my career is that people wanted to have a bridge to get insight into what I do. Now, I couldn't show them a bunch of equations, so that would put them all to sleep. But what I could do is to tell them about the narrative that, I'm, that I have access to in the mathematics, and then find a way to translate that narrative into something that everyone could get. And since we are very visual creatures, a large part of our uh, cerebral cortex is devoted to visually processing information, it became very clear to me that that was the medium that would allow me most effectively to communicate. And then the back reaction for that was, it then allowed me to even have a deeper understanding of the math. Oh. Yeah, so we'll do one more question. There's one question right over there. I was interested in knowing if you could say a little more about how your sculptures um, relate to the principle of tensegrity, of tensegrity. Well, it's, um, uh, almost every, uh, Buckminster Fuller in the late 60s, early 70s was, you know, you sort of saw these things and then you wanted to make them. And one, I started building six tensegrities then. So you're asking, uh, so at this point, um, what I'm sort of interested in is that I'm working with the six strut tensegrity still, but I'm building other structures with it. So uh, particularly when, uh, it, it works very well when three edges come to a point. So that's a dodecahedron and a cube. And, and so now you've got sort of wobbly structures that you can uh, uh, stiffen um, to what it are. And then because you have them, you keep working with um, interior structures. So. So it, it, it's uh, it, it's actually sort of going. It's actually a way of thinking about um, eliminating a solid uh, a solid corner or a, a node and replacing it with a, a node that that has sort of a, a, the ability to move. And that goes to something else I worked on, uh, is the idea that uh, 
you know, I'm working with solids, I can't pass them through a point, so I'll offset them. And, and I have a whole sort of geometry that, that of sort of what I call offsets, but I, the, the sticks are at different angles. So I, I can match convex to concave and hyperbolic to concave and convex and build a whole series of, of surfaces. And then if you use a uh, hyperbolic paraboloid, you can fill volume. So, uh, but it, it's sort of this interest in um, this non-intersection, but structure that arises out of that. So it's a weaving. It's like threads in cloth don't, uh, they go under and up and, you know, through, past each other. So that. Thank you very Sorry. much. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank the, let's thank the Please. panelists again. Uh, I, yeah. I think uh, Alex is coming up to take over now. Um, thank you, everyone. Cool. <laughs>